Albuquerque, a lot of people probably don't have basements. I don't know if people have basements here? Not yeah. really. I don't have one. Yeah. Kind of, <laughs> My RV doesn't have But, you know, it's kind of hard to get a cool space in the summer, and, you know, you can't have the stuff sitting out at 80 degrees aging, you're going to get a messed up brew. So, uh, a lot of people do the kegerator hack, and that's what can be done easily with these. It's basically just plug in the freezer. Uh, I'll, I'll show how the things plug in, but... Um, I'm going to switch over from cooling into heating topics because that's what we actually spend more of doing like interactively for meals. So the first is I have a, a fermentation chamber here that I brought along. And that's, that's kind of my own generous wording because it really is just a thrown away wine fridge. Um, uh, this is a company here that is notorious for, on Amazon for making the worst possible <laughs> wine fridge. <laughs> And people get like, I've been through three in a year, and it's like, why do you keep buying this? <laughs> but um, this device is, uh, it usually comes with a, what's called a Peltier. Is anyone familiar with Peltiers? Yeah. Uh, everyone, of course you are. <laughs> well, anyway, it can heat and cool, and apparently on this device it just breaks, so. <laughs> <laughs> not enough, not enough fan, especially for this altitude. Yeah, so you just burn out the Peltiers, that mm -hmm. probably happens. The circuit looks really cheap on it, too, it's like the paper when you got to the circuit board, but. Um, so on the back side, what I did is I took an existing wine fridge, ripped off all of the electronics it came with, and put on my own light bulb, my advanced heating system here. Yeah. <laughs> and then I have my temperature controller mounted on the back here. It's just screwed in. One screw, notice, not two. <laughs> and, uh, and I have a temperature sensor that just goes right from the controller into the fridge, and it's just taped in. And so the idea is that if I want to make kind of a low temperature heating thing, so for me, that's usually bread rising in the winter. But we would make bread once or twice a week, and it is a disaster to make bread in the winter where we are. It's like our house is pretty cold because we're cheap and you know, we don't want to have like heating on all the time. And, um, and uh, it's it, you know you just cannot get a good bread rise at like 60 degrees in, you know in the winter. So I'll usually set this up about 80 degrees, put the bread in, let it rise for an hour maybe punch it down, let it rise again, and I've been able to get much, it's been much fluffier, right? It's, it's better, been fluffy. Yeah, it's better than the rocks I used to produce. So. Uh, every day was Passover for a while. But, um, so, uh, it's, this, this also is the same device we use for making tempeh, so the fermented soybean. That's the 90 degree for 24 hours, so uh, we'll, we'll basically, um, Soak our soybeans, let them rehydrate, inoculate them with the mycelium, and then throw them in here and let it sit. And nothing happens for about at least 18 hours. Like nothing at all happens. And then in one hour, it just goes white. And then if you don't pull it within that like white mushrooming crazy time, it'll start to go black and spores will go everywhere. So it's a real tight window for making it. But um, that's another thing that we do probably once every six weeks or so in here. And finally, our third application for the fermenter chamber is uh, kimchi. Yeah, I guess we make kimchi in here. So, uh, is anyone into kimchi? No. <laughs> yeah, it's a love hate thing. I guess, you know, if you ever worked in IT, then, you know, one person can, like, ruin a day's work for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> whole office. It's that of the burnt popcorn. But, um, so, uh, we make, like, a three-day kimchi. make a real fast kimchi. We have a live culture we keep put in the cabbage, carrots, and garlic, onion, whatever you want to add to it, peppers, and uh, it's just within three days it's bubbling. But it needs a pretty warm environment, so throughout the winter I got to throw it in the chamber and it sits here for about three days at 80 degrees. And uh, last time we made it, we blew a mason jar apart. So uh, this may be a little too warm. We should put so, an X over the front glass, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Come to think of it. Yeah? Yeah. What? Tape. Glass, so when something shadows. Oh, gotcha. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, it's just glass. Yeah, maybe it's plexi. Um, so, those are our applications for the fermentation chamber. And if you don't have a broken wine fridge, even though they are so abundant, um, just a camping cooler will work fine. So, we just usually throw a light bulb. We used to just throw a light bulb in a camping cooler, but it was a little awkward. And this looks a little cooler. So. <laughs> you have a window in the front. You like nice. yogurt in there? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Like, yeah, usually I usually make yogurt in here. So yogurt, um, Tom, I know you have some experience that you can add to this, but I've been, uh, every week we get our milk delivery, so every other week I'll make a gallon of yogurt. So I take one gallon of milk, <coughs> I make like a spoonful of Greek yogurt starter uh, from our last batch, and um, 
just throw it in here. I don't pasteurize or anything because we're kind of on the raw milk tip right now until we get really sick. <laughs> then we'll be into something else, like the not raw milk tip. <laughs> but that's been cool for a while. So I just throw in a spoonful of the starter and let it sit for about 12 hours. Um, usually you can make yogurt faster in other ways, but I kind of like the no interaction version. And I just set it to temp to 110, which is about the maximum this can really do um, in this design. It can't really go much hotter than that without a bigger light bulb or um, better yeah. insulation. This really is not an insulated computer or camping cooler. Um, so I let that sit and then I just let it drain off for about uh, a few hours over a, a, a cloth napkin and get pretty heavy yogurt out of that and usually make tzatziki from it with a Greek creamy dip. How's your yogurt going? You were doing it with this well, control. The yogurt's not made yet, but the concept is fine and the uh, controller works great. Little camping cooler, uh, well, so big, why so wide, why so deep, and you, you can't really get one of those big aluminum uh, lamp reflectors inside this thing. So I took that off and found a small one, about a six-inch reflector. And I think my highest temperature test was a 40-watt bulb inside this camping cooler, and I ran the controller up to 120. It would hold 120. Wow. No problem. Right. It's all about your insulation. You can yeah. have the tiniest of heater. Right. You have an excellent, you have an insula yeah. excellent insulator. Uh, and, and the thing I, the chart, you'll get to it, I'm sure, Mikey, but the uh, the new pro on this version of controller is actually a food grade stainless steel. I found the biggest problem I had with the, the cooler was the fluctuation in temperature. It overshoot and then drop down and overshoot again. So. When I got around to starting some of the yogurt, put the controller inside one of the jars. I was just using little pint jars. Mm -hmm. And the, the fluctuations went away, and it came up to temp and stayed right there with the computer. So yeah, by using the liquid itself? Yeah, I have to reprogram it because your three minute delay uh -huh. was actually causing it to, to cycle. Cycle, okay. I wonder if you could make like a clay or some sort of, you know, a body to put it in that would give you more thermal mass. Thermal really mass and a little bit a little yes. less. Yeah. I think I'm sure I track could. with any liquid. Yeah. You need know, yeah. a cup of water. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Put it in the water. It's fine. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll get into the three minute delay. There are some like odd things I've programmed in here that make it react not the way you expect, but it's so it can be sort of broader use. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you have to have it for the fridge, so otherwise you blow the compressor. Right. Uh, so I'm going to move on here to sous vide cooking. Has anyone done sous vide cooking before? No. Yeah? How did it work out? Uh, pretty well. Yeah? What'd you make? Um, I've done a few different things. I've done uh, sous vide for uh, meat, like uh, short ribs and stuff like that, uh -huh. and steaks, and I've done sous vide eggs. Um, but I've done that with uh, basically a well insulated cooler uh -huh. and. Cooler. Yeah, and an electronic thermometer and lots of hot water, basically. Okay. <laughs> it's a lot of work to like keep it at temp. Yeah, keep like that. hot water. Right, there. right, right. So yeah, I, I have not used an electronic controller for that yet. Okay, well, I'll, I'll explain to you since it might not be familiar to everyone. It's, um, uh, this is gonna be a real poor man's version of it here, but what happened is uh, for I think over 120 years or so, French chefs have been coming up with ways to uh, cook in a vacuum, which I think with sous vide stands for pretty much cook in a vacuum. Yeah. And um, they basically, I don't know what they did 120 years ago for their vacuum and for their bagging, but today... They suck real hard. Yeah, <laughs> that's probably a full-time person. <laughs> but uh, today it's... Uh, um, I don't think it's quite that old, but... Yeah, I mean it's a little less, but the, the gastronomy thing's been there a long time. Oh yeah. Um, so, uh, today it's a plastic bag and like a, a vacuum sealer, like a food saver vacuum mm -hmm. sealer for the home version. And um, you, you will need to use actual like uh, seal a meal type boiler bags. Yeah, real bags that are thick enough and can handle the heat. Cause, like, Unless you're doing yeah. eggs, which come in there nice. Yeah, you can just <laughs> <laughs> the eggs can go right in because they got their own package shell. But, uh, but uh, Anyway, the vacuum sealer thing is you're going to need the food grade bags that can hold the temp and not just melt because like a standard even freezer bag can kind of hit the side of this and just, just kind of fall apart and foods everywhere, hot uh, water everywhere. So, um, so what you do is you usually take a piece of food, let's say, um, let's say vegetables, I actually really like to sous vide vegetables. Um, so we do parsnips and, parsnips and carrots sometimes and we just put those into a, uh, a bag, a plastic bag. Throw in some butter, a little 